All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to 2200 Hours, and welcome to Introduction to Ship Fitting. I am Adri Jericho, mentor and teacher here at Eve University. Uh, let's not waste any time, and uh, I'll get some links up in chat. First off, I'm going to link the slide deck. Uh, uh, please give me some X's up in uh, in lecture.etacuni. Uh, if you uh, can, if you can see the slides in the slide deck, that way I know it's working properly. Also, while we're doing this, I want to just as an FYI, we are going. Uh, I am currently recording this class to put into the class library, so bear that in mind. Uh, we're going to be going over a couple things uh, for, well, not, it's not really all that different from a regular class, but uh, uh, just make sure that uh, you don't uh, have your mic hot keying or keying up unexpectedly. You might want to put yourself on mute until uh, you are ready to speak. Okay, uh, let's begin then. Uh, first, to start off, a couple of class rules. Uh, I just got done mentioning, but you know, put make sure that you're not uh, making any noise and mumble, at least for the duration of the class. Um, I will, uh, however, I do want to have questions. I'll certainly, you could, if you have questions, I'll certainly answer them for you, even in the middle of the class. Just make sure that for the time being, while the class is running, you are putting your questions into the lecture.etac uni chat channel. Uh, when you do this, uh, please preface them with a capital Q. That way, I can see them better. Uh, and also, just again as an FYI, we are currently at as we all as we are always at war. Uh, I believe, yeah, it looks like HSC still has that uh, war target alt just camping our system 24/7. So uh, I would advise that you dock up in a station or citadel for your own safety during the course, just so that uh, you aren't distracted by what's going on with the class and uh, suddenly find yourself in a pod or worse. All right, so what we're going to be talk, uh, talking about in this class, we're we'll talking about uh, the ship fitting window. We'll be talking about ways that you can extend your ability to ship to, to fit ships uh, via skills and modules and rigs and, and the like. Uh, we'll be going over the module tech levels and sizes and what that means to you as far as what your uh, how to fit those onto your ships. We'll be talking about the uh, the theory behind scripted modules, how they work, and uh, what you should generally be doing with them. Uh, we're also going to be covering stacking penalties. That'll be the most complicated thing we talk about during the class, uh, and I'll be giving you at least a brief heads up about that, and as well as go over a practical example, just so you kind of understand what I mean. And we'll finish up by talking about third-party fitting tools uh, before we move on to the generic Q and A at the end of the class. So, without further ado, let's open up our ship fitting window and uh, see what we come up with. Whoa! Um, huh. That's, uh, that is a lot of stuff. <sighs> okay. Let's, let's, uh, deep breath. We can handle this. We can do this. We'll take it one step at a time. I promise you, it's not nearly as complicated as it looks. So, let's start with the top of the list, the high slot. Uh, by this point, you've already, uh, more, I'm, I'm sure most of you, if not all of you, have put modules onto your ships and you know that there are certain divisions between all the different uh, slots that you can put particular modules. We'll be going over what you can put in each individual type of slot uh, and the broad categories of modules that that, that slot contains. Uh, starting with the high slot. So, Obviously, the most notable thing you put in your high slots is guns. Everybody likes guns, un unless you're Kaldari. Then you like missiles. But everybody likes missiles, too. Unless you are trying to build a ship rather than destroy it, in which case you might like the fact that you are... That you, you might like the mining, uh, mining lasers and strip miners, things like that. All of those go into high slots as well. Uh, remote repairs. If you like to make the number, make the hit point number go up rather than go down, uh, you can fit remote repairs and uh, basically heal your buddies using high slots as well. Uh, there's actually all kinds of cool toys that you can fit exclusively to high slots, uh, and they extend the capabilities of your ship in very dramatic ways, uh, like cloaking devices, being invisible. That's a high slot only item. Uh, the probe launcher, which will allow you to scan down system anomalies, uh, find wormholes, and uh, do all kinds of interesting things in wormhole space, uh, the, or in regular space. 
Uh, maybe you can you can even scan down the location of other players with the appropriate probe launcher, and that is going to take a high slot as well. Uh, there's also tractor beams, being able to move wrecks and car cargo containers around through space, uh, which can be quite handy indeed. That'll also take up a high slot. Uh, so there's all kinds of interesting things that you can do with that. Uh, I'm going to put a, a link in chat to the complete list of high slot modules uh, that you'll find on the EUNI wiki. Uh, I'll be linking a number of these pages as we go along, uh, but uh, th these are just the, some of the broad categories and a few interesting examples. You can see the full list on that wiki page. Uh, one thing I do want to point out before we move on, though, is uh, that in particular, guns and missiles have an additional qualification that you need to, like another hoop that you have to jump through in order to, to fit them onto your ship, and that is what is referred to as the concept of hard points. You'll see in the top two corners, when you'll see turret hard points, and missile hard points. One looks kind of like a gun and the other one looks like a little launcher there. Uh, and the dots that you see uh, going diagonally up are the number of hard points that this ship has to fit guns or missiles. The particular ship that you see here actually can fit five turrets or five hard or, or I'm sorry, five missile launchers. Uh, not all at the same time, because you'll notice that this thing has, while it has 10 different hard points, it actually only has six high slots. Uh, so you're, unless you want to fit five of one and one of the other, you're going to have to make a choice of which one that you want to use. Uh, another thing that you might have noticed is that the, uh, the last slot that's up in the high slot uh, is not a gun at all. Uh, I fit four out of the five potential turret hard points. Uh, you can see with the four filled in dots and the uh, uh, and the unfilled in dot that in indicates that I can fit one more gun in there. But there's also one more slot that I have placed another module into. Uh, and uh, you'll see this quite often is uh, 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 ships will have more high slots, typically one or maybe two more high slots than they have hard points for weapons. And the last hard, uh, the high, last high slot is referred to as a utility high slot, where you usually put something like a cloaking device or a probe launcher, or in this case, I fit a, uh, a module that increases the uh, the range of my drones and how far away they can be from my ship. Uh, Rexlet asks why is it why it's called uh, high as in high slot. Uh, it's really just more for flavor. Uh, if you if you really had to have an answer, uh, the uh, the modules that tend to go into high slots generally take up the most other resources. CPU and power grid. We'll be talking about that little in a little bit, little bit. Uh, but they tend to use up the, the most resources of most things on your ship. Uh, but uh, they are pretty much just. It is pretty much just for flavor because you know, as we'll find out when we talk about low slots, you can you can find some modules that take up quite a lot of power grid in the low slot as well. So don't take that as a hard and fast rule. Uh, the last thing I want to call your attention to is the little boxes up at the top of the guns that you see. You'll see one that only one that looks like a gun and then the other three uh, look like a big crate with a little uh, little ammo shell. Uh, and uh, that is because those three are loaded guns while the fourth one, the, the very first one is unloaded. And the white, uh, the white rectangles refer to how much ammunition is left in the gun before it needs to be reloaded. Uh, we'll actually see this again in the mid slot, and I'll talk about that when we get there. Speaking of the mid slots, uh, the mid slots also have a category of uh, of modules that tend to go into them. Uh, the shield tanking modules. If you want to make, if you want to fit your ship to tank on the shields rather than on the armor or the hull hit points, you're going to be using mid slots to do it by and large. Uh, whether it's stuff that makes your shields uh, gives you additional shield hit points, things to increase the resistances of your shields, things to recharge your shields in the middle of the fight, uh, those are all going to be mid slots. Uh, you'll also see propulsion modules, also known as prop mods, on your mid slots as well. Uh, things like uh, things like afterburners and microwarp drives. Those are the two categories of prop mods, and both of them go into the mid slot. 
uh, tackle modules, things that uh, prevent, t prevent ships who are trying to get away from you from actually leaving. A uh, warp scrambler will, uh, warp disruptors or scramblers will prevent them from warping away and uh, webifiers, stasis webifiers will prevent them from moving as quickly as they would otherwise like. Uh, and uh, both of those are also found in the mid slots. Electronic warfare modules or e-war modules uh, are found here as well. Uh, that those are things like uh, like ECMs, which will prevent your enemy from targeting anything. And if they can't target anything, it means they can't really do much of anything to that target, uh, whether it's helpful or harmful. So uh, you can perhaps uh, you can use ECMs on the enemy logistics who are healing the enemy fleet and to prevent them from doing that. That's a popular use of e of e war, uh, but there are other e war modules as well. Stuff that uh, will disrupt how well their guns track, things that uh, uh, mess with their ability to target at long ranges or how long it takes them to target. Uh, stuff that makes them a bigger target for your own boats. Uh, all of those things fall under e war, and all of them will be found in the mid slot, guaranteed. Uh, if you like to do exploration type things, if you like to do relic and data sites, you're going to need to use the mid-slot mid for a relic or a data analyzer or both, depending on if you happen to have a place where you can dock and fit them if you're on a long trip and you can't, uh, actually, uh, can't actually switch between the two. Uh, you might have to fit both of them onto the mid-slots, uh, and, uh, and that's where they're going to be fit. Now, I want to call your attention also to the fact that uh, since these categories of modules are going to be found in the mid slots guaranteed, you'll notice a couple of conflicts here. That uh, if you are a shield tanking ship, then you are actually going to have a little bit of trouble fitting tackle modules. You can fit a, a tackle module or two, like a warp scrambler or a stasis webifier, but Every one that you fit is taking away from how potentially tanky that you can be on the shields. So there's a trade-off that you have to make that if you're going to be a shield tanking ship, uh, you're going to have to give up a little bit if you want to also fit uh, a, like a prop mod or a tackle mod. And uh, oftentimes electronic warships fit armor regardless of what else they uh, of what they, their their whole their whole fittings might suggest because they just need to use so many mid slots on e-war modules that uh, they just can't fit an act adequate shield tank so let's move on to the low slots low slots much like uh, armor tank or shield tanking is for mid slots armor tanking is found exclusively in the low slots uh, again that's going to be armor plates for uh, adding on to your hit points uh, armor hardeners for increasing resistances, armor wrappers for he healing them in the middle of combat. Uh, all those things are found in the low slots. Uh, damage upgrades, things that uh, will increase the damage that you do with a weapon as well as decrease the cycle time, which makes you fire more often. Uh, those types of things are also found exclusively in low slots. Speed upgrades, things that will make you uh, go, travel faster at subwarp velocities, things that will uh, increase your agility to make you turn and uh, turn your ship, change speeds, align to celestial objects, and get to warp faster. Uh, all of those types of things are found in the low slots. Uh, also, a little special module that uh, I of note. Uh, here, a special tanking module called the damage control, which is non a non-specific tanking module that increases the resistances of your shields, armor, and hull all at the same time. This module is found exclusively in the low slot. Uh, so even if you are a shield tanker, you probably still want to put a damage control in the low slot uh, just for the extra bonus that it provides, as well as this being the only way to uh, to have hull resistances at all. And uh, it provides a pretty significant buffer with the extra resistances that you get. It's a pretty big, big boost there. So also something that you want to uh, check out regardless of what you're tanking. And notice here again, we have a conflict. If you want to have a particularly speedy ship, whether it's agility or just your a fast top speed, you're going to have to give up the fact that you are, uh, th that you're also maybe wanting to armor tank. 
Uh, it's difficult to fit a armor tank and be pretty fast, uh, not just for that reason, but that uh, often t uh, there are aspects of the armor tank that make your ship go slower just by virtue of having them. And then couple that with the fact that uh, all the speed upgrades are located in the slow in the low slots, uh, and you're you're liable to have a pretty slow ship indeed. So you have to balance that, and uh, maybe consider if you want a fast ship, maybe you consider uh, having a uh, having a shield tanker instead. Okay, so um, down at the in the bottom right corner, you'll see the little blue and red bars, CP and power grid. These are basically just two different resources that all ships have that uh, limit what they can fit. All modules, by and large, have uh, CPU and power grid requirements. Uh, that varies depending on the module itself. Uh, weapons tend to require a pretty significant amount of both. Uh, some modules, however, uh, like the uh, inertial stabilizers that will increase your ship agility, don't require any of those resources at all. Uh, so it's basically just an, one more limitation as to what how you can fit your ship, and it's it's worth uh, it's worth keeping an eye on that as you fit your ship to see what's taking up the most amount of your CPU and power grid, and seeing maybe where you might have to cut back just in case you need to fit more things. Uh, just as a just to be perfectly clear though uh, CPU and power grid are not used up permanently as, as soon as a module is removed whatever CPU and power grid it was taking up is returned to you and you can fit something else okay so next we'll talk about rigs and calibration so uh, up in the upper left there are three rig slots as well as a bar, that little gray bar there, uh, that uh, uh, looks a lot like the CPU and power grid. Calibration is a special resource that only rigs use, uh, and uh, all ships have 400 calibration to use, uh, with the exception of pirate uh, pirate ships, or I'm sorry, pirate vessels or faction vessels that uh, only have 350, uh, and uh, uh, the other uh, the other caveat to the three rig slots is tech two ships only have two rig slots but uh, everywhere else you'll see 400 calibration and three rig slots and rigs are little upgrades that you can make to your ship that will upgrade your ship in one way but also usually harm it in another uh, so the basic idea is that it's kind of like it's kind of like overclocking your uh, your uh, the, your processor and your computer, where you're making your ship do something it wasn't necessarily designed to do, and uh, there might be a couple drawbacks uh, uh, for you having done so. Uh, and uh, uh, it's it can but like having but these upgrades are very valuable typically and uh, it's worth having them. Uh, just thematically, you might think of uh, you might think of rigging your ship as uh, uh, you know as an engineer of the ship uh, saying to the captain, "Hey, I upgraded our uh, cargo space, so we can haul more things around now." And the captain says, "Great, how did you do it?" "Oh well, I took off some of the old armor plates that we really weren't using." "You did what?" Yeah, that's kind of what rigging is like. Uh, and incidentally, that actually, the that specific example is in fact a rig that you can apply to your ship. You can sacrifice armor hit points for more cargo capacity. God help you if you do, but it's a thing you can. Uh, the other aspect of rigs that you have to bear in mind is that rigs are permanent. Once you apply them to the ship, uh, you cannot unfit them without destroying them. So they're not permanent in that they can never be removed but they can but you'll never get it back uh, is the is the takeaway there so before you fit a rig to your ship uh, make sure that you are fitting the right one and you really really mean it uh, I just remember I re remembered I have been neglecting to link some other things in chat the complete list of highs or of mid slot items low slot modules here is the complete list of rigs. So in case you want a more complete list of all of those things, there they are for you. All right, so uh, down in the lower left, you'll see the cargo bay and the drone bay. These are pretty straightforward. Uh, the cargo bay holds things, drone bay holds drones. Uh, bear in mind, these do not mix. The uh, uh, anything if you want to actually launch drones in combat in the middle of uh, it, while you're in flight, uh, they do have to be launched from the drone bay. And if you happen to run out of drones for whatever reason, maybe you left them behind, maybe they got destroyed, 
Uh, the Any drones that you have in your cargo bay do not count uh, towards drones in your drone bay and cannot be launched. You'll have to find some way to get them from your cargo bay to your drone bay, whether that be docking up and moving them over, uh, a, uh, oh, what are they called? The, uh, oh, I'm totally drawing blank on this and I really shouldn't. Uh, I think I've got one somewhere here. Um, oh, where are you? Uh, not the mobile tractor unit, the other one. Um, mobile Depot, I believe, is what that's called. Uh, someone make sure that I got that right, <laughs> please. Uh, but uh, yeah, the Mobile Depot is one way that you can do so. But any, basically, you need some method of changing the fit of your ship, which is not something you can typically do while you're in flight. Uh, so uh, bear that in mind. If you can't just bring as many drones as you have ca cargo space. You can, but you have, you're going to have to find a way to manipulate them in space. Uh, Nyan Nostro links the mobile depot. That is indeed the thing I was talking about. Thank you for doing so. I feel better about myself. I can't believe I could remember that. Anyway, so uh, up in the upper right, there is a neat little button called simulation mode, uh, which uh, goes... Uh, actually, we're going to talk about attributes tab first because the, uh, these two things tie in with each other. The attributes tab, uh, which you'll see in, it looks like a several bars in that, like I, I've got, I got it circled in yellow or in, in green there, uh, will show you all the vital statistics of your ship, your resistances, you know, how well you can target things, how fast you are, you know, all those sorts of things. Uh, and it's useful to know uh, what the capabilities of your ship are as you fit it. However, not everything that your ship has equipped will necessarily reflect in those stats right away. For example, uh, a armor hardener is a module that only increases your armor while it is running. And while your ship is docked, your armor hardener isn't running. So how can you tell how your ship will perform with and on? That is what the simulation mode is, like I was saying before. You click on simulation mode and you'll get a little screen that looks a little bit like this. Uh, you'll see a whole bunch of the modules now highlighted in green uh, and actually various colors. Uh, and uh, now you can basically see what happens when you turn these, uh, turn these modules on and off. Uh, this will also allow you to simulate overheating modules, which is not something that you can do any other way in the EVE client. Uh, and so the, if you take a look at down at the bottom in the low slots, you'll see all the different kinds of, or all the different appearances of the mods uh, that uh, you can have in simulation mode. Uh, obviously on the far left is an empty slot. And then next to that going to the right is a passive module that just, you know, it, it does what it does. And that reflects on your ship stats, whether you're in simulation mode or not. Uh, then there is a gray module, an active module that is uh, that is currently not turned on. Uh, so this is not reflecting in your ship stats yet. Next to that is a, a module in green. This is a module that is currently activated, so it is reflected in your in your stats. Highlighted in red is an overheated module, so it's actually doing double duty. Uh, so uh, that will and now show in your stats and then finally all the way on the right is an offline module It's fit to your ship, but it is not currently using up any CPU or power grid But you also can't do anything with it until you turn it online So this is a way that you can definitely make sure that you uh, Use simulation mode when you fit modules that need to be turned on uh, Because otherwise the your ship stats will lie to you and then over on the left, on the top left, you'll see the skins and the saved fits module browser. Uh, the browser will allow you to find modules to fit onto a simulated fit. You don't necessarily have to own a module in order to see it, whether it's equipable on your ship or not with your particular skills. Uh, you can actually fit any module in the entire game onto a simulation fit, uh, whether you own it or not. And uh, you will find them in the module browser. If you take a look at the uh, at the hardware tab on the right, if you actually open up uh, your fitting window by hitting Alt F, uh, you will be able to see the hardware module in the in the uh, the left of the two tabs in that little section on the far left. 
and uh, you'll be able to search any item. You'll be able to sort by slot, uh, and this will generally help you out by finding uh, what you know what kind of thing you're trying to fit to your ship. Uh, there's little sub buttons down at the bottom, modules and charges. Modules are what you're fitting to your ship. Charges are things like ammunition and scripts. So if you need to load something into a uh, into a module uh, and see how that affects your ship, uh, then you'll find it in charges. On the left of that, holes and fits next to hardware, uh, that is where you can save any module or um, any any fits that you have ever that you've ever made uh, for later use. That way, if you have a fit that you, put, that you like put in particular, uh, and you happen to lose that ship, all you have to do is open up the fit, and not only can you fit all the modules with one click, but you can also create a buy order, a little shopping list for all the modules involved, uh, and all the ammo, all the drones, anything that's saved in that fit will be part of that shopping list. So it's a way that you can reship very rapidly and I highly recommend that you use it. Uh, also, the, this, you can also, uh, next to your personal fittings, uh, you can also check out corporation fittings. Uh, corporations will generally have uh, uh, current fittings that they like to use in their fleet doctrines and it's worth checking those out. Uh, I don't know how well EUNI's uh, corporation fittings have been kept up to date, so take any that you see with a grain of salt, but at the, at the very least, maybe you can use them to get an idea of what kind of, uh, what kind of fit will work for your ship, just to have a starting place. They have not. Okay, so yeah, do not, uh, do not pay any attention to the corp fittings. Uh, usually check out the, uh, the Eve, Uni Wiki is sometimes okay. Uh, I think the best place is probably going to be either Fleet Up, we'll talk about that later on, or any forum posts that say, we're flying this ship, which is the, about the, as updated as you're going to get. And then on the top of that uh, little wrench icon for the browser is the skins menu. Uh, skins are space bling. They have no effect on your ship's performance at, at, at all, but they do look rather nice. I'm kind of fond of the uh, uh, the police skin. Uh, the or the con or is it the police fed? How did, I don't remember what, no, what that's called. Uh, some of the, the, I know that's on the Megatron. It's on the Fed Navy Comet. Uh, there's it, the, you, you basically got little red and blue flashy lights, and who doesn't like that? And that is the entire ship fitting window. So it took us a little bit to get through, but we got there. Uh, and uh, this is pretty much all you need to know about the ship fitting window. So now you're ready to get out there and uh, start fitting a, fitting a ship. Except maybe you'd like to know ways that you can extend the fittings of your ship. And that is what these skills are for. Uh, now I'm not going to list all. I'm not going to read through all these skills. So this is just a basic list, uh, but it's not necessarily a completely comprehensive list either. Uh, I do want to call attention to two categories of skills here. Uh, the CPU and po CPU management, power grid management, will just give you straight up CPU and power grid bonuses to all ships. Uh, and so I highly, highly recommend that you max those guys out. But once you get there, there are a number of, of skills like weapons upgrades that will reduce the uh, power grid or CPU needs of particular kinds of modules. So just because you've maxed out the CPU and power grid for a ship doesn't necessarily mean you've maxed out the fitting capabilities of it because you can sometimes reduce what modules need to fit on your ship. And it's, high, and it's very worthwhile to do that. And in case you need more power than that, you can actually use modules and rigs to extend your ship's fitting capabilities as well. Uh, if you need more CPU, you can fit a coprocessor in the low slot, which will increase your CPU by a percentage. Uh, you can also do the same thing with the, in a rig slot uh, with the processor overclocking unit, uh, which uh, does effectively the same thing. Uh, it does have the drawback of reducing the recharge rate of your shield, but if that's not really a thing that you care about, then maybe you go ahead and go for that, uh, that uh, rig and uh, call it good. If you need more power grid, however, uh, you're going to have to use one of these uh, modules or rigs down on the bottom. Uh, the micro auxiliary power core is a unique module that uh, is, uh, it doesn't really, like everything else increases the CPU or power grid by a percentage. This guy gives out a flat power grid bonus, just uh, like, you know, some number. Uh, and uh, most ships have 
enough power grid that uh, scaling it by a percentage is usually better than this. But frigates and destroyers usually have a power grid small enough that it just uh, using something like a reactor control unit power diagnostic system isn't worthwhile because you don't get an, you actually get more out of the power core than you get out of those guys, and so you'll typically see that on smaller ships. But you can, uh, but pr typically in the larger ships uh, from cruiser on above, you'll see the reactor control unit, the ancillary current router, the power diagnostic system. All of those guys will scale it by a percentage. The power diagnostic system is also kind of unique. It is, it is not as good. At, it doesn't give you as much power grid scaling as the reactor control unit, but it also gives you shield and capacitor bonuses as well. So if you are just shy of the power power grid needs for your ship, maybe you try fitting a power diagnostic system first uh, before you fit the reactor control unit. And if it's still not good enough, then you can fit the reactor control unit. But uh, if you can somehow swing getting those power grid, and, uh, I'm sorry, the, the shield and capacitor bonuses, uh, then that's definitely worthwhile. So now that we know how to maximize our fitting capabilities, now we need to decide what specific modules to put on our ship. And how can, oh, oh. Wow, not again. Look at all these guys. How are we going to decide what module to put in their ship? Like, there's got like 20 modules there. And and they all have different names. And one of them says delineative. And uh, what are we going to do? What we're going to do is we're going to cl click on the compare tool down at the bottom. I have, I have highlighted them green. Because all these modules do about the same thing, but they all do it very, very slightly differently. And uh, when we click on that button, we'll get a screen that looks like this, which maybe looks about as intimidating as the one before. But uh, now we have a bunch of categories that will tell us the individual nuances of each one of these modules. So right now, uh, we have the, let's take a look at the Warp Scrambler. If you take a look at the Optimal Range category, which we have checked over in the check tick boxes over on the left, uh, you'll see that the range gradually goes up. Uh, there's a scope where, uh, there's a scope one that's 8250 meters, uh, and whereas the regular one is just uh, 7500. Uh, it, and it goes even up even higher than that as you go to the faction modules and the, and the tech two. Uh, and uh, uh, you can also see that uh, the uh, amount of CPU that, say, the Dark Blood Warp Scrambler uses is 30, as opposed to the Keldari Navy Warp Scrambler, which is 22. Uh, so they all have their unique advantages and disadvantages. You know, if you if your fitting is tight, maybe you got to fit something that uh, uses only 22 teraflops of uh, CPU. But if you need the, the the largest range you can possibly get, maybe you go for that uh, Dark Blood Warp Scrambler after all. Uh, so this is, a, this is a great way that you can uh, see exactly what it is that you're getting uh, when you fit a particular module uh, and, uh, and find out, it, you know, just find out where the differences are in the categories that matter to you. Now, modules also come in different sizes. Not all of them, but a, a pretty large number of them do. Uh, you'll see things that uh, they don't, uh, sometimes they'll say that they are small, medium, and large. Sometimes they see, uh, you'll see that they are, uh, sometimes their their sizes are a little bit more nuanced than that. Like a 75 millimeter rail gun is, it happens to be a small uh, gun, but it doesn't necessarily imply that unless you happen to know that. Uh, so uh, a lot of modules are made with their like their fitting requirements with particular ship classes in mind, uh, and you can see those different cla uh, classes break broken down into small, medium, and large holes. But that's not to say that you can't actually put uh, modules that are not meant for your ship onto your ship, even uh, even if it's maybe slightly bigger than or smaller than uh, the module in question uh, than the ship in question. Uh, a lot of fits use oversized modules. Uh, a great example of this would be the shield extender. Uh, the fitting requirements of shield extenders are so low that it's pretty easy for even a frigate to fit a medium shield extender. In fact, the vast majority of shield tent frigates will be using medium uh, uh, medium shield extenders. Another module that's pretty popular over uh, to oversize is prop mods like afterburners and micro warp drives. Uh, and you can use those to, uh, because the different sizes of prop mods have thrust that's appropriate to the mass 
of the ship uh, than putting the engine of a large battleship onto your medium-sized cruiser is kind of like putting a snowmobile engine onto a uh, onto like a go-kart uh, and you can make it really really go uh, and uh, you know, check out. You can uh, one popular ship for doing that is the Stabber. Is a, a lot of people like to use that one as a racing Stabber, and it's pretty fun. So uh, moving on to scripted modules, uh, we'll cover these briefly as well. The, uh, the certain modules you might, if the the Eagle Eye Dofu may have spied one of these on the fit on the slides in the beginning. Uh, and uh, this is a this tracking computer is in the mid slot of the ship that you saw in the beginning on that Gnosis. Uh, and uh, you, the thing that you might have noticed is that it looks like it has little ammo boxes as though it were a gun. That's because you can fit scripts to tracking, computer, or to tracking computers or any scripted module uh, that alter its, you know, like what it actually, ha what actually happens when you turn it on. A tracking computer by itself will give you a bonus to optimal range, fall off range, and tracking speed, but you can forego the range bonuses and double the tracking speed by fitting it with a tracking speed script. Uh, also vice versa, you can fit a optimal range script to double the range bonuses while losing out on the tracking speed bonus. So you can basically get exactly what you need rather than a little mix of everything. And it's generally worthwhile to script it all the time. Uh, scripting, uh, the, there, there's no, uh, it doesn't, when you script a module, it doesn't use up the script as though it were ammunition. You can always remove the script and get it back. Uh, the only time that you can't do that is while the module is running. You have to turn it off first. But then from there, uh, any reload of any different kind of script is instant. So you can you can change scripts on the fly. And indeed, you really should do so in order to, uh, to keep up with an evolving situation. All right, and lastly, we're going to be talking about stacking penalties. This, again, I, I mentioned in the beginning, this is the most complicated thing we'll talk about. So if you don't get it right away, uh, that's okay. Uh, you, uh, you're, you're doing all right. So if, 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 you found out, if you've found everything else pretty easy so far, then you're doing all right. But sooner or later, you will come on a module whose description says this. Using one of these, more, more than using more than one type of this module or similar modules that have had the same attribute on the ship will be penalized. What does that mean? If you take a look at the chart, basically as you put more of the same module or modules that do the same thing as the one that you're putting on, because different modules can affect the same stat, then each additional one you put on will not work as well as it would otherwise. Uh, you can see a little chart uh, there that as you, like you'll notice that uh, the very first one, the number one, is at 100% effectiveness, but then the second one is at 86.9% effectiveness. So if you were, if you were about to get another, uh, oh, I don't know, another 10% extra speed, uh, you would actually only get about 8.5% extra speed out of that module if it was the second one of its type. Uh, modules are all ordered by strength and penalized individually, so you might be thinking to yourselves that, uh, you, that you have to worry about what modules to put on in what order to make sure that you're optimizing so that the, the best modules get the best benefit, and you don't have to worry about any of that because Eve already figures out the strength of all the modules and optimizes the whole thing automatically on the fly so that you get the best benefit that you possibly could out of your particular combination of modules, whatever they happen to be. Even if a ship comes by later on and somehow gives you a buff to one of those, sh to, to one of those uh, stats, uh, then Eve will reevaluate it and, uh, and, and figure out where in that stacking penalty order it is, reorder everything, and optimize it all over again. So you don't have to worry about people putting on the uh, remote sensor boosters in the right order either. E will figure it out all for you. Uh, I'm also going to take, uh, take a moment to link the uh, complete list of stacking penalties on the wiki uh, so that you can see all the different stats that uh, are subject to this. However, this is, again, this is a little complicated and maybe it doesn't make sense right away. So let's go over a, uh, a concrete example uh, just to get an idea of how it works. 
So let's start off with a base lock range of 45 kilometers. That's as far away as a ship can be for you to be able to lock onto it. So you decide that you need a longer range than that. So you put on a scripted sensor booster, which will increase your lock range by a, a whopping 60%. Uh, that will increase it to 72 kilometers. And uh, since this is the first module that you've put on here, there's no stacking penalties associated with it. Uh, so you get the full benefit out of it. Uh, so there's no losses. But then you decide you, know, you want even more. So you put on a sensor booster without a script uh, and uh, you get an extra 30% uh, extra lock range. Now, if stacking penalties were not a thing, then you would get a uh, another 30 percent extra lock range uh, it's multiplicative so you get uh, you would end up with 94 kilometers of lock range but since stacking penalties do exist this second module will be penalized by uh, by multiplying it by 86.9 percent which has it which has it coming out to a 26 percent boost to your lock range instead meaning that you only got 91 kilometers out of it uh, and you lost three kilometers of range you know no, that's that's not too bad uh, we're still doing okay but now you put on a third module you put a signal amplifier in your low slot uh, this gives you another 30%, which without stacking penalties would give you uh, 122 kilometers. But since, again, stacking penalties do exist, we are now looking at a 57.1% multiplicative penalty on it, which has it come out to a 17% bonus, meaning you only get a 106 kilometer range for the whole stack of modules that you have, which means you lost 16 kilometers to what it otherwise would have been without stacking penalties. Notice the sensor booster is still operating at what it was before. Uh, it's just this, this third module that is now down to 57.1. Now, something interesting happens. A friendly ship comes along with a command burst and uh, gives an AOE buff with an information command burst, which, among other things, gives you additional lock range to your ship. Now, the this reorders the whole list because the 34% bonus is better than the 30% bonuses for this from the sensor booster and the signal amplifier. So if you work out the math without stacking penalties, it's 163 kilometers of lock range at this point. But uh, if you if we actually factor in stacking penalties, the sensor booster and the signal amplifier are now bumped down the list. Uh, the sensor booster, whereas it used to be at 86.9, is now at 57.1. The signal amplifier has been knocked down to 28.3 and is only giving 8% of its bonus. And so you still did get a bonus here. You got 119 kilometers of range. It's just getting to the point where you really should start thinking about putting a different module on your ship because it's only going to get worse from here. We've already lost 44 kilometers of potential lock range. And at this point, it's maybe better to start fitting some, something else to your ship that hasn't been penalized quite so harshly. All right, let's talk about third-party fitting tools really quick. Uh, the uh, third-party fitting tools are things you can download to put together fits offline. Uh, and uh, oftentimes, in fact, many times, they have features that make them far and away superior to fitting ships in the EVE client itself. Uh, the gold standard of fitting clients right now is PIFA. Uh, it is a cross-platform. Uh, you, know, you, you, you can use it on Mac, you can use it on Linux, you can use it on Windows. Uh, and uh, it's, there's so many cool things you can do with PIFA. Uh, not, only, not just save fittings uh, for later use, but you can also do all the things that the simulator can do and then some. You can not only simulate what happens when you overheat all your modules, you can also simulate what happens when another ship is uh, is buffing you and you can put the uh, like for example if they if you they, if they gave you extra lock range kind of like we just saw with that uh, last uh, example in the stacking penalties they information bursted you and you got extra lock range you can put together not just the ship uh, uh, that is bur that is boosting you but the person and their skills the skills of the person who is flying it Put that ship together and then add that ship as a booster to the current ship and you can see exactly what happens when you get a boost from that guy. Uh, it's it, it's really, really cool what you can do. Uh, eventually, I'm going to be putting together a master class on using some of the more advanced 
uh, uh, tools with PyFa. So I really highly, highly recommend that you use it. Uh, you can use it to export fitting. You can export fittings to it, export from PyFa back into the Eve client. It's all around just tremendous. You need to go get it right now. But if you don't want to get PyFa for whatever reason, you can also get something called EVHQ, which is a little bit more of a generic tool uh, that uh, it does fitting. Uh, I don't know exactly how well because I think that the update uh, uh, schedule and the team working on it is probably not quite as with the times as PyFa tends to be. But EVHQ also has a number of other things that it can offer you, uh, like asset tracking, uh, things that you can uh, use to uh, find your market orders. And uh, I believe it has a skill planner so that you can uh, put together a plan for your skills far out into the future. Uh, so EVHQ is, uh, while not necessarily the ultimate uh, fitting tool, uh, does have its perks. And uh, if you are intrigued, uh, you might you might find it useful, if not pretty. I, I find that user, user interface of EVHQ to be kind of eye-catching and appealing, if maybe a little messy. Uh, Web-based fitting tools are things like FleetUp and Osmium.org. Uh, FleetUp.com is a tremendous resource for coordinating doctrines for uh, for corporations. EUni has a FleetUp. Uh, a fleet of, not account exactly, but you can basically sign into your uh, to uh, your fleet of account and uh, uh, basically find all the fits that Eve tends to fly. Uh, it will also, if you uh, if you click on different things like show flyable while you are looking at a particular uh, fleet comp uh, fleet composition, it'll suggest to you ships that you are qualified to fly and how well, as well as give you suggestions as to what skills that you should train in order to fly that particular ship better. It's great for discovering uh, new fits that uh, are going to be useful to your fellow Unistas and your FCs, definitely check it out. Osmium.org, it tends to be a little bit more of a public uh, uh, on online fitting tool where people will post fits that, uh, just for general use. So if you aren't sure where to start with a fit of a particular ship that you want to fly, maybe you go to osmium.org, look up the ship and see what is out there and uh, see what people have been rating up, see what comments that they made on it and uh, see, maybe you just use it as a starting point even. Uh, it's it's worth seeing what other people have done uh, and uh, and uh, checking out uh, what, uh, what kind of ship fittings are, are out there. You might uh, see a suggestion that you might never have seen before. And with that, that is uh, all the content that I have for this uh, particular class. Uh, I'm going to link in chat the class feedback form. Uh, I'd appreciate it if you guys would click on that link and uh, give me uh, give me some ratings on the uh, on the speed of the class, the amount of information, whether it went too fast, too slow, too much, too little, uh, any comments that you have, uh, all all of that stuff is aggregated. Uh, and the comments are uh, are they, they don't you don't see them I don't see the names of anybody who posted anything I don't even see the names of who submitted the feedback at all so uh, by all means fill out anything that you think would be useful uh, any I appreciate it I get to read all the comments so make sure that uh, you uh, that you fill that out I'd really appreciate that. Uh, at this point, I'm going to open up comms so that uh, you know, people can continue to ask questions in chat if they want to, but they can also uh, use Mumble to ask questions as well. Uh, so please, by all means, ask away. No, the floor is yours. Go ahead. Yeah, great question. So there's a lot of just little. It's 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 sometimes maybe a little bit difficult to convey exactly how awesome that uh, using these things can can be until you've actually done it. But like I'm, I have a I have Pypha up, up right now, and just as an example, remember we were talking about the uh, uh, different modules that you can fit uh, the. Um, uh, uh, like the, all the different versions of the same module uh, and the, like the meta versions. 
Uh, so what you can do with uh, PIFA is you can right click on any module that you have currently selected uh, or currently fit to your ship and there's a little variations drop down that you'll see every single variation that exists in a little menu and you can just click on one of those guys and change it over to that one instantly uh, so that you can see like if you're a little bit over on your CPU uh, then you can uh, maybe switch to a different one uh, just very, very easily and see if that uh, happens to put you under on your CPU. Uh, I also mentioned the compare tool earlier. Uh, there's actually a better version of the compare tool built into PIFA. When you get the stats on any different, uh, on any individual module, uh, you'll not only get the description and the attributes of what it does, requirements and things like that, there's also a compare tab that it's kind of like the compare tool, but it automatically puts everything, like it automatically highlights all of the uh, categories and only the categories where there actually is a difference in the way that the modules operate. So if every single module uses one power or one megawatt for your power grid, then it won't even bother putting the power grid category there at all because there's no difference between all of them. The compare tool for PIFA is just a lot more, uh, it's, it's, you'll spend a lot less time like making, uh, like clicking to make everything just the way you want it. And it'll just be all right there for you. Uh, another really great, exa great example of why PIFA is great is you can load in your skills so that you uh, so that you know whether something is flyable to you. But just in case, you might also want to know if a ship is flyable at all, if if it's possible to fit this particular ship. And there's an there's a character already pre-built into PIFA that it's a theoretical character, not a real character, but he has all five uh, all five of all skills. So you can just switch over to that character. And and see what that ship looks like with all five skills. Uh, and you can also, even if you already can fit it, you can also see like, you know, what is the difference between me and flying this ship perfectly? How much extra DPS can I theoretically squeeze out of this by increasing skills? The, the list goes on and on and on, and it's hard to convey all the, in, all the really cool things PIFA does without teaching a full-on class on it, but hopefully that more or less answers your question, or at least encourages you to try it out and see for yourself. All right, Tishab Nandos asks, if lacking CPU slash power, what would suggest first, rig or low slot module? Really, that depends. It, uh, it depends on the type of ship that you're flying. So if you are flying a shield tanking ship, uh, particularly one that uh, requires, uh, one that like, has a really good passive recharge, uh, and honestly, the, the bigger your shield uh, capacity is, the better your recharge will be just all by itself, even without upgrading your recharge at all, uh, which can be somewhat significant in a longer fight. So the rig will hurt, will hurt that by a little bit. And if you're fitting, if you're flying a shield tank ship, maybe you don't want to do that. Maybe you go for the low slot after all. After all, you're not really using your low slots uh, in order to extend your tank all that much. Uh, there are a few low slot shield tank modules to be sure, but it's not quite as intensive as the mid slots. Uh, and you might also consider like, you know, what else are you giving up by using those slots? Uh, you can improve your tank still further by using rig slots. Uh, but like there are things that you'll increase your, the amount of hit points that you have, like your shield buffer, you'll be able to increase your resistances using rigs. So simply by virtue of what you're giving up by not using that slot for something else is a very, con is a, is a very significant consideration. There's no one answer to that question and uh, time and experience will tell you what you should do in any individual situation. PD and uh, Andadar asks, do any modules fit in across high and mid and low slots? Uh, I want to say that you are asking, and correct me if I'm wrong, it seems that you're asking, are there modules that affect the same thing, but, uh, but like are in multiple different kinds of slots? And uh, I think that's what you're asking. And uh, okay, yes. So there are um, there are things that will do this. Uh, like for example, the uh, I, I'm pretty sure that uh, there are modules that increase the 
Uh, oh, I, I know, I know, I know. I'll need, actually, before I go much further, I'm going to link the self, self-paced self slide deck so you guys can thumb through my uh, slide deck without necessarily me having to, like, click on the, click over, click you over to the right tool. Uh, but if I'm not much mistaken, um, here we go. So there are cap rechargers in the mid slots and uh, cap, oh, cap relays. Uh, in the low slots, which both do the same thing. They increase the recharge rate of your capacitor, uh, albeit in different amounts. Uh, and so like there is a little bit of overlap here and there. Uh, so, uh, and generally those will be things that are more universal that it's it's hard from a design standpoint to justify, you know, n like nerfing the shield tanking or like just or giving shield tankers such a hard time as to never be able to, fl to use uh, a reach a, a, a capacitor recharging module and so that's why they have cap recharge modules on both uh, mid slots and low slots i want to say the mid slots are actually stronger i could be wrong on that but uh, there are there is at least the cap relays in the low slots so yes there are there is a little bit of overlap here and there uh, and you'll be able to get a better idea of what the uh, of what those what that overlap is. If you take a look at the complete list of high, mid, and low slot modules on the wiki, like I linked in, in chat earlier, because those are all sorted by category. And so just check out overlapping categories and see what exists, and you'll be able to find them pretty easily. Rick Slot asks, what ship has the most slots and how many? <laughs> um, boy, I'm not entirely sure. Uh, I, I would, to be honest, I don't fly capital ships. Uh, I would be willing to say that those guys tend to have the most slots uh, just overall, but uh, some noteworthy ships, uh, or at least ship classes, uh, that have a lot of slots uh, in one category or another. Uh, destroyers have eight slots in the high slots, and uh, oftentimes will be able to uh, will be able to fit guns to all of them. Uh, not all of them, uh, or not all, or I should say, not all destroyers will be able to fit eight guns. Sometimes it's only seven, but the Catalyst is a great example of a eight-slot destroyer, and you don't have to put guns in them. Uh, remember, we talked about the tractor beams. A poor man salvaging ship might be a Catalyst that uses four tractor beams to pull all the wrecks in towards you, and four salvagers to actually salvage their uh, uh, to salvage the remains. So there's all kinds of neat things that you can do with uh, with ships that go beyond what their original uh, design might suggest just by taking a look at the bonuses that the ship has. Um, the, uh, the, the oftentimes some of the most effective fits are the ones that are most purposefully fit towards a very specific role, even if it wasn't exactly the role that CCP had in mind when they designed the ship. Sendray Lynn asks, is there a way to simulate implants in the in-game fitting window, or should I have or would I have to rely on third-party fitting window? Um, you I would say that you can sim simulate implants by having them equipped, like that they will be taken into account during a during a simulation if you have them in your head, but I don't believe that you can well, heck, let's see if we can maybe uh, let's see if we can find any implants in the uh let's see here i don't see a category for them so i would assume not uh you will have to turn to something like pypha to simulate the uh the any mod or um, uh, any implants that you have uh but at the same time the uh they will also add them to the shopping list for the uh for the ship as well uh another that's another really great thing about uh pypha is that pypha has a pretty accurate uh a, pre a pretty accurate uh, cost of the ship a running total of the ship as well as the individual cost of the modules and the drones and the implants and everything um the in uh, the in-game fitting tool also has this i suppose although it really only gives you an estimate uh, oh, I know. You can actually point at the estimate, and it'll break it down for you. Uh, but Pypha had uh, had one first, and it also uh, likes. It also allows you to default it to GDA prices, uh, as opposed to just whatever region that you happen to be in. So there's that. 
Neon Nasu asks, how much ISK should you spend on the fitting relative to the ship cost? Well, again, that really depends. Uh, the, uh, it, it depends on exactly what you intend to do with the ship. Uh, a good rule of thumb is that uh, if, you're, if, if, you have a, if you run the real risk of losing the ship, uh, which is technically all the time, but if, if you're taking the ship out for a fight, then, uh, you know, I, I mean, obviously only take what you can afford, uh, but uh, the, you, you can usually use the actual budget of the ship hull itself as an additional budget for the modules. Uh, but uh, then again, maybe you might want to deviate from that for individual fits. Uh, like I personally have a racing stabber fit that I've been working on that uh, costs 215 million isk, whereas the hull of the slasher, or the, the slasher, the stabber, only costs, what, eight, nine million, if that? Um, and it just so happens that I need a ship that has that kind of performance, and 215 million is the price tag on that ship, so I'll pay it. You know, uh, I, don't, I haven't paid it yet, and you know, maybe I'll get around to it one of these days. But uh, there's not really a hard and fast rule on that either. Uh, just you know, only take what you can afford. Uh, but the more expensive that the ship is, the ship hull, oftentimes the blingier that uh, it's worth making that ship just to get your money's worth. Uh, I mean, the classic example is capital ships, especially things like Titans, that uh, you'll you'll never see a Titan kill mail that doesn't have just a whole bunch of officer mods and faction mods because you know you've al you're already spending you know a, a couple trillion or so on the on the hull. You know why not you know another a few trillion on the uh, on the actual modules themselves any other questions and uh, don't limit it to just questions necessarily about fitting uh, maybe you have some questions about an individual fit on an individual ship that uh, either you don't know where to start or maybe you're kind of halfway there but you can't quite make it work and you need a suggestion as to what kind of modules will actually make it do what you're trying to do uh, so if you have something like that again feel free to ask away okay cinderellaen links a dramiel fit that uh, is not quite making it in terms of the CPU. Uh, give me a second to load that into Pypha and uh, we'll play around with it, see what we can make it, see what, see what we can do here. So it looks like, you're not kidding, it is, uh, even with all five skills, uh, you're not able to actually make that work. Uh, so, I mean, you know, what, what, uh, there's a couple things you could downgrade. Uh, gyro stabilizer could be downgraded down to the counterbalanced version, which will, Let's see, if we take this gun, give it, say, Republic Fleet Phased Plasma just to give us the largest amount of DPS. Um, so if we put that back to what it was, your DPS is uh, 150 DPS. So when you downgrade down to counterbalanced, you're losing 4 DPS, which is not horrible. Uh, and it allows you to actually fit it in the first place. Uh, you might consider... Yes, you've already got the compact SIBO, so that's not, you can't really downgrade that. I wouldn't recommend downgrading the tank, uh, I wouldn't say. Um, maybe your afterburner might be something that we can play with. Just let me take a look at the stats here. Um, again, th this is Pypha in action. You know, we are, like I just opened up, the like I did module stats on the afterburner, and uh, clicked on the compare tab, and now I can see that the Gisti B Type 1 Mega Newton Afterburner, here it is, um, uses 15 teraflops. Oh, okay, so that actually is the lowest amount of. Uh, that's, the, that's the lowest CPU, uh, CPU requirement of any, uh, of any uh, Afterburner unless you count. The compact one, the tech one, or the, the Meta Zero compact, or the Meta Six analog booster, which honestly, I uh, this is a 50 million afterburner. I don't know if I'd. I mean, you're already using a 22 million one, uh, but you are losing 20% extra uh, extra speed on that, which is pretty significant. Uh, you're already using the light scout light scout auto cannon, which is the best there so yeah i 
I would recommend either dropping the counter one of the gyro stablers or gy gyro stabilizers down on down one notch. Um, maybe you can get an implant. I think somebody mentioned an implant earlier. The the Zeno Gypsy CPU Management EE six hundred one, which will give you a uh, it gives you one percent bonus to CPU. Let me just grab that in uh, in Pypha. Yep, that that all by itself would do it. Uh, if I just switch this back, yep, that implant, the EE six hundred one, will definitely do it. Um, let me uh, price it out for you. Um, yeah, the the EE six hundred one it costs less than a million, so you may as well treat that implant like it's just another module on your ship. Uh, and that will allow you to fly it with both of the gyro stabilizers at gyro stabilizers at Tech Two. So uh, it's uh, uh, let's see, Cinderella NAS. I don't think I can use the implant because I'm using a power grid one for something, probably a stealth bomber. You might consider having a different clone available uh, for that for that as well. Then uh, there's a, a module or there's a skill called Infomorph Infomorph technology or no infomorph psychology which as you level it up will allow you to have more cl uh, jump clones and uh you can basically just you can use jump clones not just for travel but to have what amounts to a clone dedicated to flying a particular kind of ship so uh if you happen to have a few spare clones lying around that are completely empty uh then you can throw this guy into it and uh if you happen if you have to destroy the implant to make room for another one it costs you less than a million not bad at all all right do we have any further questions uh for this class any other fits that you need help with um anything uh, did, did anybody uh, did everybody understand uh uh, stacking penalty is okay. Uh, I know that one's kind of a tough one. Uh, so if you have any weird stacking penalty questions about uh, how that works, uh, feel feel free to speak up. Now is the time. So the thing about uh, about align time uh, for going to warp is that there's a little bit of a weird nuance there that the game doesn't really tell you, uh, and that's the fact that because of the way that uh, ships, because of the way that the the server interacts with the client, it does so using ticks, and so you know, like I have a. Uh, th this Dramule, by the way, is an excellent example of what I'm about to talk about. It has an align time of 3.01 seconds, which um, I think I, I'm a little unclear on how the server tick things interacts with that. But what can very likely happen is uh, your align time with this ship might actually be four seconds because it doesn't like, because a, a tick happens every second, and the game does and the server doesn't really like simulate every single millisecond uh, like you otherwise might think. So. This particular ship, it, well, it it's, it's one of two things, and like I'm, I won't say definitively whether it's one or the other because, quite frankly, I don't know. But it's either going to be a ship that always aligns in four seconds because it's 3.01, which would be tremendously un unfortunate, or it might be a ship that aligns in three seconds 99% of the time and in four seconds 1% of the time because of that 0.01 seconds in the align time. So... Uh, it's you, you have to kind of do some Pypha math to uh, well let Pypha do the heavy lifting for your math, uh, but whether it's possible to get an insta uh, an instant align time, I don't I haven't seen a ship with an align time of less than two seconds in a long time. It might be a thing still. Um, I've never seen one with uh, with a one second align time unless it's something like a pod. So uh, I, I think that's what you're asking, uh, but feel free to clarify if I didn't quite answer it. Of course the Hecate can align on layer one. What can't the Hecate do? 
the other thing you have to consider with the ultra uh, with the instant locker is that uh, you have to sort of take into account that uh, there's a human being behind there as well. So unless they have like unless they're doing something absolutely perfectly where they have a overview that literally displays nothing except you and they spam click on on, on you as soon as you pop up. Uh, and you uh, and they try to get your get their scram on you for, and, and all that stuff uh, there might even still be a problem trying to uh, actually apply the warp scrambler after you lock because it's just it's that's just a tricky thing to do so even if theoretically you are catchable uh, oftentimes you you are you are you, you might actually be uh in like practically uncatchable uh and oftentimes people people will rely on more reliable ways to catch you like bubbles and null sec anyway so uh so there you go okay well it looks like we are reaching the end of our q a here unless anybody has any last minute questions or any last minute fits uh, feel free to speak up now or forever hold your peace or at least until next class uh, in the meantime i will link the class feedback form uh, one more time in chat uh, just in case uh, those of those of you who stuck around for the uh, oh I, I missed a whole bunch of chat i'm sorry i was i was scrolled up um I'm sorry, there's a whole bunch more questions I need to answer. Rixla asks, what would I have to do to make this fit into a PvE fit? Uh, here's a Cinnabol. Change the shield damage resistance, perhaps? Uh, let me copy that over and see what happens. So here we have a Cinnabol, Cinnabol, or I, I like to call them Cinnabons. Um, as, a, uh, as a PvE fit, I mean, what does it mean to be a PvE fit exactly? Like, you have to kind of state a use case for the ship. And, like, you know, a, a PvE fit might imply that you, that you are on grid with a whole bunch of predictable rats who have predictable damage uh, for an extended period of time, which implies that maybe you need a... Uh, some some type of reps, some type of uh, of recovery of your hit points, so that you aren't eventually whittled down. Uh, Twenty six thousand hit points is not a huge, 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 huge amount uh, for a mission boat. Uh, it's actually pretty, uh, depending on the mission that you're running. Uh, if you get to like level fours and whatnot, twenty six thousand will be chewed through of, uh, eventually, if not rapidly, depending on how and where you are flying. Uh, so what you might want to do here is find a way to uh, increase the uh, find a way to give yourself some extra reps here. Uh, you can do uh, shields ha can go one of two routes. They can uh, they can either do passive recharge, uh, focusing on modules that happen in the low slots. I think there's a couple of rigs that do that too, if I'm not much mistaken. Uh, and getting a huge, huge buffer that uh, will scale your regeneration that much, uh, that much harder. Uh, you could also consider not having uh, the uh, not having quite so high in the resist category, uh, and have a and switch out a uh, an active repper, uh, or for or switch out for an active repper on your boat, uh, and uh, this would also uh, this is more viable in PVE, especially because you know what kind of damage that you'll be taking, so you can fit your resistances specifically to that rather than having to fit the broad spectrum. Because right now you have two adaptive and vulnerability fields, and uh, quite frankly, that's that's covering two resistances that you probably aren't going to use depending on who you're fighting. Like Garistas are uh, kinetic and thermal, and so the resistance that you're getting out of EM and explosive here are useless to you. You're not really using them. So what you might consider is actually just dropping both of those guys and putting on a, uh, a kinetic hardener and a thermal hardener. Maybe you still have an invulnerability field just swapped out for something else. Um, the uh, Oh, you do actually have a shield repper on there. I didn't quite see that. I'm sorry. I'm not, I'm not as familiar with shield repping ships. So, uh, but, uh, you, so those are some ideas as, as to what you can do with that. Uh, again, it really depends on what kind of PvE that you're flying against, uh, and you really have to take into consideration the very specific uh, th situation that you're going to find the ship in, because the more specifically you can fit it, the stronger it's going to be. 
Neon Nostro asks, I'm flying this Vexor at the moment for level 2 DED 3, 10, 3 of 10 and all high sec anomalies without problem. Would this Gnosis be a good fit for level 3 and maybe 4s as an Alpha Galente? And is there something wrong with the Vex? All right, so let me copy both of these over to Pypha, uh, just so I know what I'm looking at. Uh, incidentally, another really, really cool thing about Pypha is uh, I have a character set up in Pypha. And not, again, not a real character, but like a skills set up in Pypha. Uh, that, uh, is, that I basically as I drop down my characters for like what skills I want to use, I have an alpha account for all four races. So I can, uh, even if I myself am not an alpha, which actually I am, so I can relate to what you're trying to do, Neon. Uh, but uh, if uh, someone comes to me asking for a fit, uh, I can make sure that it's possible for an alpha to fit it. So let's get the Galente Alpha guy flying this uh, Vexer. And it looks like you have a regen rate of 54.2 hit points per second at the absolute max. Um, and uh, you have some extra armor buffer in your rigs. Um, the reactive armor hardener is something I actually approve of quite a bit. Uh, I think the reactive armor hardener is a severely underutilized module uh, and uh, I actually use one to the exclusion of damage controls. Uh, one interesting thing is that damage controls do not suffer, uh, they do not suffer stacking penalties with other resistance modules, uh, except for reactive armor hardeners, which do the same thing. They don't su suffer stacking penalties with other resistance modules, except for the damage control. So those two will sort of reduce each other's effectiveness, but at 86.9%, uh, they're still pretty worthwhile to have. I prefer the reactive armor hardener to the damage control when flying PVE, especially with an active repper, because I don't think that I really need to worry about my whole hit points if I never get down to hull uh, in, during the entire fight anyway. So my any hull resistances I get there are wasted. But if I'm going to have... Uh, if I'm going to have one of the others, it's going to be the reactive armor hardener, but that doesn't stop me from having a damage control too. Uh, with that said, I uh, the all the buffer that you have on this ship is, I think, frankly unnecessary. Uh, the like the 800 millimeter plate that you have on there, I think you could drop uh, and uh, maybe do something else with. Then again, what are you really going to do on a uh, on a Vexer? You know, like that doesn't have a bonus to guns. So, you know, maybe maybe what you could do is you could sub that up for some specific resistances because you'll, again, you'll always know in PvE what that type of damage that you're going to go up against. Just look it up on the internet. Uh, so you can use that to fit resistances. Um, there aren't a whole lot in the way of rig slots for drone damage. Uh, so you could use those for resistance holes if you felt like it. Uh, you could maybe fit a second repper to actually get a little bit more reps out of it, although I don't think it'd be very cap stable if you did that. Uh, maybe you could instead fit a cap relay uh, to give yourself an extra, uh, a little bit of extra capacitor on that. Uh, bear in mind, it's not, it's not completely necessary for a PVE boat to be completely cap stable uh, because it really depends on, you know, am I running my afterburner at the time? No, then maybe having 16 minutes worth of, uh, of you know, full-on reps, not quite so necessary. Uh, or, I'm sorry, uh, having 16 minutes of, uh, of like, full-on reps with no breaks is perfectly acceptable because you expect the mission to be done by that point. You know, that kind of thing. Now, with that said, um, a Vexer will probably not be able to do level 4 missions, at least not very well, uh, especially not for an Alpha Galente. Uh, however, uh, there is an interesting forum thread uh, on the uh, on the Eve Uni forums of a guy who is trying to run level four missions with a Gnosis, uh, and the Gnosis is probably the most appropriate ship for a Alpha account to use for level four missions because it's just the largest ship you can fly. You you can't fly any other battle cruisers, uh, and you definitely can't fly any uh, any any battleships. So that would be a good one to use. Um, 
I'm taking a look at the one you have right now, and again, it looks like you are using primarily uh, Omni Resist, which you really don't need to do. Uh, you can, I would highly recommend that you fit uh, resistance modules, uh, like active hardeners that are specifically against the uh, particular mission that you're flying. Um, and uh, because, you'll, because you are an alpha, you can't use tech two hardeners, but you can use faction hardeners, which do give you the same resistance amount as the as tech 2 hardeners just without the actual uh, skill requirements and so and, and they're relatively cheap you can get all of them f uh, a full complement of all the damage types for under 10 million and as long as you aren't burning through mission boats on a regular basis which i would hope that you're not uh, then they're pretty economical to use uh, and you can get upwards of you know, 50, 60, I think it's, uh, is it 55 percent? 55 percent resistance on a single hardener towards a single damage type, uh, which is like you'd, you'd probably do even better than putting on the damage control on there. Uh, so it's definitely worthwhile to uh, to fit on the active to tank against the damage you're taking because it's one of the few times in Eve when you actually can prepare ahead of time for that sort of thing. So definitely, I would go for that. Union Piper was saying, is looking for a decent Ocator fit. Um, you're gonna have to hopefully someone else in the chat has one i because i sure don't i haven't actually flown any of the tech 2 haulers uh, but uh, i do know that uh, they tend to be uh, that you they really want to go crazy on the uh, on the active hardeners because uh, i want to say uh, let me just, just double check that i know what i'm talking about here but i want to say the uh, bonuses are for um da, da, da. Oh, yes yes there it is there it is overheating so having active hardeners on those guys is very very important uh, because overheating just gives you absurd resist to the point where you have over a hundred thousand hit points uh, and it's tremendous but uh, i don't i don't have a fit for you i'm sorry uh, i'll see what i can come up with Send Rayland and asks, is oversized afterburner fit still viable on certain ships, or should I be looking to use the extra fitting space for other things? Uh, here is a succubus using a uh, using a oversized afterburner, a medium afterburner. Um, I would say that are you plan uh, it's that 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 ship that boat says mission. Are you using this to PVE? Uh, in which case, I'm not entirely sure that you need to worry too much about speed uh, or subwarp speed. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to assume this is a, PV, this is a PvP boat, uh, just the way that this looks. Uh, but uh, the Succubus is uh, definitely a ship that uh, would benefit from an oversized afterburner uh, just because it has that afterburner bonus, uh, speed bonus. Uh, so if you're going to do it on any, on any ship, the succubus is a pretty strong contender. But you know it, that doesn't that doesn't necessarily mean that uh, the ship is viable just because it has a oversized afterburner. Uh, you have to kind of consider the use case of the ship, and uh, that's the most difficult thing to do. Is when you're doing a when you're fitting a ship for PvP, you can't just put together the ship and then bask in your numbers in PIFA, accurate though they may be, you have to consider the practical scenario of what it is that you're gonna be getting into. How do you expect a fight to start? You know, what do you what are you gonna be doing in the first few seconds of the fight? Can you are, are you like do you expect to have to close to to close range very, very quickly? Do you do you expect to scram kite? You know, stuff like that. So um, oh, I just realized this thing doesn't have any tackle, so maybe this isn't a, PvE boat, a PvP boat. But nonetheless, uh, you really should consider what exactly that you're getting out of the fact that you have an oversized afterburner, uh, because uh, maybe a regular afterburner will do. Uh, it just depends on what you plan to be fighting. And again, the more specifically that you can fit a ship to the scenario that you are planning for, the more effective that your ship will be. Okay, I think I am caught up on questions. So, unless there's anything further, 
I think we are going to call the Q&A section for the day. Uh, speak up with any last questions. Uh, in the meantime, again, I'll fl look class feedback form for those of you who stuck around for the Q&A, but uh, maybe we're caught up in as asking questions. Uh, again, I appreciate any feedback that you have. Uh, the, the written comments are always the best because like they provide me the most direct feedback and it's just it's just nice to hear what's on your guys's mind uh, so with that i think we're gonna call the class thank you everybody for showing up uh, and uh, if you have any questions about this in going on in the future you can contact me in game via any method that you care to choose adri jericho uh, i am uh, available for private conversations eve mail uh, you can hit me up on slack or the forums anytime that you have any weird oddity question, even though I don't know the answer, I'll do my best to find out. Anyway, thanks for showing up for class, everybody, and uh, hope, uh, hope that you learned something, and hope to see you again next time.